Within the coach, the passengers eyed one another curiously in the dim light of dawn. Right at the back, in the best seats of all, Monsieur and Madame Loiseau, wholesale wine merchants of the Rue Grand Pont, slumbered opposite each other. Formerly clerk to a merchant who had failed in business, Loiseau had bought his master's interest and made a fortune for himself. He sold very bad wine at a very low price to the retail dealers in the country, and had the reputation among his friends and acquaintances of being a shrewd rascal, a true Norman, full of quips and wiles. So well established was his character as a cheat, that in the mouths of the citizens of Rouen, the very name of Loiseau became a byword for sharp practice. Above and beyond this, Loiseau was noted for his practical jokes of every description, his tricks, good or ill-natured, and no one could mention his name without adding at once, He's an extraordinary man, Loiseau. He was undersized and pot-bellied, had a florid face with grayish whiskers. His wife, tall, strong, determined, with a loud voice and a decided manner, represented the spirit of order and arithmetic in the business house which Loiseau enlivened by his jovial activity. Beside them, dignified in bearing, belonging to a superior caste, sat Monsieur Carré Lamadon, a man of considerable importance, a king in the cotton trade, proprietor of three spinning mills, officer of the Legion of Honor, and member of the General Council. During the whole time the empire was in the ascendancy, he remained the chief of the well-disposed opposition, merely in order to command a higher value for his devotion when he should rally to the cause, which he meanwhile opposed with courteous weapons, to use his own expression. Madame Carré Lamadon, much younger than her husband, was the consolation of all the officers of good family quartered at Rouen. Pretty, slender, graceful, she sat opposite her husband, curled up in her furs, and gazed mournfully at the sorry interior of the coach. Her neighbors, the Comte and Comtesse Hubert de Breville, bore one of the noblest and most ancient names in Normandy. The Count, a nobleman advanced in years and of aristocratic bearing, strove to enhance by every artifice of the toilet his natural resemblance to King Henry the Fourth, who, according to a legend of which the family was inordinately proud, had been a favoured lover of a de Breville lady, and father of her child, the frail one's husband having, in recognition of this fact, been made a count and governor of a province. A colleague of Monsieur Carré Lamadon in the General Council, Count Hubert represented the Orleanist party in his department. The story of his marriage with the daughter of a small shipowner at Nantes had always remained more or less of a mystery, but, as the Countess had an air of unmistakable breeding, entertained faultlessly, and was even supposed to have been loved by a son of Louis-Philippe, the nobility vied with one another in doing her honour and her drawing-room remained the most select in the whole countryside, the only one which retained the old spirit of gallantry, and to which access was not easy. The fortune of the Prévilles, all in real estate, amounted, it was said, to five hundred thousand francs a year. These six people occupied the farther end of the coach, and represented society with an income, the strong established society of good people with religion and principle. It happened by chance that all the women were seated on the same side, and the countess had, moreover, as neighbors, two nuns, who spent the time in fingering their long rosaries and murmuring paternosters and aves. One of them was old, and so deeply pitted with smallpox, that she looked for all the world as if she had received a charge of shot full in the face. The other, of sickly appearance, had a pretty but wasted countenance and a narrow consumptive chest, sapped by that devouring faith which is the making of martyrs and visionaries. A man and woman, sitting opposite the two nuns, attracted all eyes. The 
man, a well-known character, was Cornudet, the Democrat, the terror of all respectable people. For the past twenty years his big red beard had been on terms of intimate acquaintance with the tankards of all the Republican cafés. With the help of his comrades and brethren, he had dissipated a respectable fortune left him by his father, an old established confectioner, and he now impatiently awaited the Republic, that he might at last be rewarded with the post he had earned by his revolutionary orgies. On the 4th of September, possibly as a result of a practical joke, he was led to believe that he had been appointed prefect. But when he attempted to take up the duties of the position, the clerks in charge of the office refused to recognize his authority, and he was compelled, in consequence, to retire. A good sort of fellow in other respects, inoffensive and obliging, he had thrown himself zealously into the work of making an organized defense of the town. He had pits dug in the level country, young forest trees felled, and traps set on all the roads. Then, at the approach of the enemy, thoroughly satisfied with his preparations, he had hastily returned to the town. He thought he might now do more good at Havre, where new entrenchments would soon be necessary. The woman, who belonged to the courtesan class, was celebrated for an embonpoint unusual for her age, which had earned for her the sobriquet of Boule de Suif. Short and round, fat as a pig, with puffy fingers constricted at the joints, looking like rows of short sausages, with a shiny, tightly stretched skin, and an enormous bust filling out the bodice of her dress, she was yet attractive and much sought after owing to her fresh and pleasing appearance. Her face was like a crimson apple, a peony bud just bursting into bloom. She had two magnificent dark eyes, fringed with thick heavy lashes, which cast a shadow into their depths. Her mouth was small, ripe, kissable, and was furnished with the tiniest of white teeth. As soon as she was recognized, the respectable matrons of the party began to whisper among themselves, and the words hussy and public scandal were uttered so loudly that Boule de Suif raised her head. She forthwith cast such a challenging, bold look at her neighbors that a sudden silence fell on the company, and all lowered their eyes, with the exception of Loiseau, who watched her with evident interest. But conversation was soon resumed among the three ladies, whom the presence of this girl had suddenly drawn together in the bonds of friendship, one might almost say in those of intimacy. They decided that they ought to combine, as it were, in their dignity as wives in face of this shameless hussy, for legitimized love always despises its easy-going brother. The three men also, brought together by a certain conservative instinct awakened by the presence of Cornudet, spoke of money manners in a tone expressive of contempt for the poor. Count Hubert related the losses he had sustained at the hands of the Prussians, spoke of the cattle which had been stolen from him, the crops which had been ruined, with the easy manner of a nobleman who was also a tenfold millionaire and whom such reverses would scarcely inconvenience for a single year. M. Carré Lamédon, a man of wide experience in the cotton industry, had taken care to send six hundred thousand francs to England as provision against the rainy day he was always anticipating. As for Loiseau, he had managed to sell to the French commissariat department all the wines he had in stock so that the state now owed him a considerable sum, which he hoped to receive at Havre. And all three eyed one another in friendly, well-disposed fashion. Although of varying social status, they were united in their brotherhood of money, in that vast Freemasonry made up of those who possess, who can jingle gold wherever they choose to put their hands into their breeches' pockets. The coach went along so slowly that at ten o'clock in the morning it had not covered twelve miles. Three times the men of the party got out and climbed the hills on foot. The passengers were becoming uneasy, 
for they had counted on lunching at Totes, and it seemed now as if they would hardly arrive there before nightfall. Everyone was eagerly looking out for an inn by the roadside, when suddenly the coach foundered in a snowdrift, and it took two hours to extricate it. As appetites increased, their spirits fell. No inn, no wine-shop could be discovered, the approach of the Prussians and the transit of the starving French troops having frightened away all business. The men sought food in the farmhouses beside the road, but could not find so much as a crust of bread, for the suspicious peasant invariably hid his stores, for fear of being pillaged by the soldiers, who, being entirely without food, would take violent possession of everything they found. About one o'clock, Loiseau announced that he positively had a big hollow in his stomach. They had all been suffering in the same way for some time, and the increasing gnawings of hunger had put an end to all conversation. Now and then someone yawned, another followed his example, and each in turn, according to his character, breeding, and social position, yawned, either quietly or noisily, placing his hand before the gaping void whence issued breath condensed into vapor. Several times Boule de Suif stooped, as if searching for something under her petticoats. She would hesitate a moment, look at her neighbors, and then quietly sit upright again. All faces were pale and drawn. Loiseau declared he would give a thousand francs for a knuckle of ham. His wife made an involuntary and quickly checked gesture of protest. It always hurt her to hear of money being squandered, and she could not even understand jokes on such a subject. As a matter of fact, I don't feel well, said the Count. Why did I not think of bringing provisions? Each one reproached himself in similar fashion. Cornudet, however, had a bottle of rum, which he offered to his neighbors. They all coldly refused except Oiseau, who took a sip and returned the bottle with thanks, saying, That's good stuff. It warms one up and cheats the appetite. The alcohol put him in good humor, and he proposed they should do as the sailors did in the song, eat the fattest of the passengers. This indirect allusion to Boule de Suif shocked the respectable members of the party. No one replied, only Cornudet smiled. The two good sisters had ceased to mumble their rosary, and with hands enfolded in their wide sleeves, sat motionless, their eyes steadfastly cast down, doubtless offering up as a sacrifice to heaven the suffering it had sent them. At last, at three o'clock, as they were in the midst of an apparently limitless plain, with not a single village in sight, Boule de Suif stooped quickly, and drew from underneath the seat a large basket covered with a white napkin. From this she extracted, first of all, a small earthenware plate and a silver drinking cup, then an enormous dish containing two whole chickens cut into joints and embedded in jelly. The basket was seen to contain other good things, pies, fruit, dainties of all sorts, provisions in fine for a three days' journey, rendering their owner independent of wayside inns. The necks of four bottles protruded from among the food. She took a chicken wing and began to eat it daintily, together with one of those rolls called in Normandy Regions. All looks were directed toward her. An odor of food filled the air, causing nostrils to dilate, mouths to water, and jaws to contract painfully. The scorn of the ladies for this disreputable female grew positively ferocious. They would have liked to kill her, or throw her and her drinking cup, her basket and her provisions, out of the coach into the snow of the road below. But Loiseau's gaze was fixed greedily on the dish of chicken. He said, Well, well, this lady had more forethought than the rest of us. Some people think of everything. She looked up at him. Would you like some, sir? 
It is hard to go on fasting all day. He bowed. Upon my soul, I can't refuse. I cannot hold out another minute. All is fair in wartime, is it not, madame? And, casting a glance on those around, he added, At times like this, it is very pleasant to meet with obliging people. He spread a newspaper over his knees to avoid soiling his trousers, and with a pocket knife he always carried, helped himself to a chicken leg coated with jelly, which he thereupon proceeded to devour. Then Boule de Suif, in low, humble tones, invited the nuns to partake of her repast. They both accepted the offer unhesitatingly, and, after a few stammered words of thanks, began to eat quickly, without raising their eyes. Neither did Cornudet refuse his neighbor's offer, and in combination with the nuns, a sort of table was formed by opening out the newspaper over the four pairs of knees. Mouths kept opening and shutting, ferociously masticating and devouring the food. Loiseau, in his corner, was hard at work, and in low tones urged his wife to follow his example. She held out for a long time, but overstrained nature gave way at last. Her husband, assuming his politest manner, asked their charming companion if he might be allowed to offer Madame Loiseau a small helping. Why, certainly, sir she replied with an amiable smile, holding out the dish. When the first bottle of claret was opened, some embarrassment was caused by the fact that there was only one drinking cup, but this was passed from one to another after being wiped. Cornudet alone, doubtless in a spirit of gallantry, raised to his own lips that part of the rim which was still moist from those of his fair neighbor. Then, surrounded by people who were eating, and well nigh suffocated by the odor of food, the Comte and Comtesse de Breville and Monsieur and Madame Carrelamadon endured that hateful form of torture which has perpetuated the name of Tantalus. All at once the manufacturer's young wife heaved a sigh which made every one turn and look at her. She was white as the snow without. Her eyes closed, her head fell forward. She had fainted. Her husband, beside himself, implored the help of his neighbors. No one seemed to know what to do until the elder of the two nuns, raising the patient's head, placed Boule de Suif's drinking cup to her lips and made her swallow a few drops of wine. The pretty invalid moved, opened her eyes, smiled, and declared in a feeble voice that she was all right again. But to prevent a recurrence of the catastrophe, the nun made her drink a cupful of claret, adding, It's just hunger. That's what is wrong with you. Then Boule de Suif, blushing and embarrassed, stammered, looking at the four passengers who were still fasting. Mon Dieu, if I might offer these ladies and gentlemen... She stopped short, fearing a snub. But Loiseau continued, Hang it all! In such a case as this, we are all brothers and sisters, and ought to assist each other. Come, come, ladies, don't stand on ceremony, for goodness sake. Do we even know whether we shall find a house in which to pass the night? At our present rate of going, we shan't be at Tote till midday tomorrow. They hesitated, no one daring to be the first to accept. But the Count settled the question. He turned toward the abashed girl, and in his most distinguished manner said, We accept gratefully, madame. As usual, it was only the first step that cost. This Rubicon once crossed, they set to work with a will. The basket was emptied. It still contained a pâté de foie gras, a lark pie, a piece of smoked tongue, Croissant pears, Pont Levesque gingerbread, fancy cakes, and a cup full of pickled gherkins and onions. Boule de Suif, like all women, being very fond of indigestible things. They could not eat this girl's provisions without speaking to her. So they began to talk, stiffly at first, 
Then, as she seemed by no means forward, with greater freedom, Madame de Breville and Carre la Madon, who were accomplished women of the world, were gracious and tactful. The countess especially displayed that amiable condescension characteristic of great ladies whom no contact with baser mortals can sully, and was absolutely charming. But the sturdy Madame Loiseau, who had the soul of a gendarme, continued morose, speaking little and eating much. Conversation naturally turned on the war. Terrible stories were told about the Prussians, deeds of bravery were recounted of the French, and all these people who were fleeing themselves were ready to pay homage to the courage of their compatriots. Personal experiences soon followed, and Boule Suif related with genuine emotion, and with that warmth of language not uncommon in women of her class and temperament, how it came about that she had left Rouen. I thought at first that I should be able to stay, she said. My house was well stocked with provisions, and it seemed better to put up with feeding a few soldiers than to banish myself goodness knows where. But when I saw these Prussians, it was too much for me. My blood boiled with rage. I wept the whole day for very shame. Oh, if only I had been a man. I looked at them from my window, the fat swine with their pointed helmets, and my maid held my hands to keep me from throwing my furniture down on them. Then some of them were quartered on me. I flew at the throat of the first one who entered. They are just as easy to strangle as other men, and I'd have been the death of that one if I hadn't been dragged away from him by my hair. I had to hide after that, and as soon as I could get an opportunity, I left the place. And here I am. She was warmly congratulated. She rose in the estimation of her companions, who had not been so brave. And Cornudet listened to her with the approving and benevolent smile of an apostle, the smile a priest might wear in listening to a devotee praising God. For long-bearded Democrats of his type have a monopoly of patriotism, just as priests have a monopoly of religion. He held forth, in turn, with dogmatic self-assurance, in the style of the proclamations daily pasted on the walls of the town, winding up with a specimen of stump oratory in which he reviled that besotted fool of Louis Napoleon. But Boule de Suif was indignant, for she was an ardent Bonapartist. She turned as red as a cherry, and stammered in her wrath, I'd just like to have seen you in his place, you and your sort. There would have been a nice mix-up. Oh, yes, it was you who betrayed that man. It would be impossible to live in France if we were governed by such rascals as you. Cornudet, unmoved by this tirade, still smiled a superior contemptuous smile, and one felt that high words were impending, when the Count interposed, and, not without difficulty, succeeded in calming the exasperated woman, saying that all sincere opinions ought to be respected. But the Countess and the manufacturer's wife, imbued with the unreasoning hatred of the upper classes for the Republic, an instinct, moreover, with the affection felt by all women for the pomp and circumstance of despotic government, were drawn, in spite of themselves, toward this dignified young woman, whose opinions coincided so closely with their own. The basket was empty. The ten people had finished its contents without difficulty and general regret that it did not hold more. Conversation went on a little longer, though it flagged somewhat after the passengers had finished eating. Night fell, the darkness grew deeper and deeper, and the cold made Boule de Suif shiver, in spite of her plumpness. So Madame de Breville offered her her foot warmer, the fuel of which had been several times renewed since the morning, and she accepted the offer at once, for her feet were icy cold. Mesdames Carrière Madon and Loiseau gave theirs to the nuns. 
The driver lighted his lanterns. They cast a bright gleam on the cloud of vapor which hovered over the sweating flanks of the horses and on the roadside snow, which seemed to unroll as they went along in the changing light of the lamps. All was now indistinguishable in the coach. But suddenly a movement occurred in the corner occupied by Boule de Suif and Cornudet, and Boiseau, peering into the gloom, fancied he saw the big bearded democrat move hastily to one side, as though he had received a well-directed though noiseless blow in the dark. 